Good morning, Peter Gertz. I'm a psychiatrist. Being a doctor brings with it a lot of responsibility, and that's just the fact. So what I'm talking about in this situation is suicidal ideation, suicidal patients, and when to hospitalize them and when not to. And what brought me to talk about this today is I saw three patients last week, and I'll give you a little idea of each one. The first one was a relatively young lady who had been using methamphetamine and presented to the ER with suicidal thinking. The second one was a young gentleman who'd been using heroin and also presented with suicidal thinking. And both of the first two patients I'm talking about had major social issues, a lot of stress in their life, very difficult circumstances. The third patient had suffered a major loss the day before, was crying, overwhelmed, and when I asked her three times about suicidal thinking, she just wouldn't answer, which to me was not a good sign at all. So the first two patients, bottom line, I felt comfortable enough with them not being hospitalized and they were discharged from the emergency room the third patient, I did not feel comfortable with her, her being discharged from the emergency room and she was admitted to a psychiatric ward or the plan was to do so. I'm not, can't say for sure whether that happened. That was after I saw her. So you wanna do the basics. You wanna look at the background of the patient and risk factors for suicide, known risk factors. That's just the basic thing to do <clears throat> and Sex, so male sex is more at risk in general. Age, older people tend to be more at risk, even though now a lot of very young people are having suicidal thinking. Teenagers a lot, young teenagers also. Depression, of course, is a risk factor for suicide. And a previous suicide attempt is a major risk factor also. And substance abuse, alcohol, drugs, are risk factors for suicide. Not thinking rationally. So if someone's psychotic, hearing voices telling them to kill themselves, or paranoid, wants to get away from people who are persecuting them or following them, they sometimes can kill themselves just to get away from other people who are, whom they're paranoid about. Terrible situation. Lack of social support, so major social stress, homelessness can contribute. An organized plan is a bad sign as far as risk for suicide. Not having a spouse is a risk for suicide. And being medically ill, so severe medical illness is a major stressor, of course. You want to also look at, do they have a lot of medications at home? Do they have the means to easily commit suicide at home or once they leave the ER? So a whole lot of dangerous, potentially dangerous medications like opioid medication at home, or do they have a gun at home? Do they have access to a gun? You want to get collateral information if at all possible. And that was one of my problems with the first two patients I mentioned. I was not able to reach anyone who could give me information about them. So that was a difficult thing because then it makes it harder to make a decision, in my opinion, about whether or not a patient needs to be hospitalized psychiatrically if they're suicidal or if they presented with suicidal thinking. Bottom line, after all that, going through the basics, risk factors, getting collateral, you want to trust your feeling. You want to trust your instincts. How do you feel? What is your overall feeling about the patient? And do you feel on a gut level that they're dangerous, that they're a danger to themselves? Another thing I do is talk with the emergency room doctor or try my best to, and that often gives additional information about patients. For instance, last week, 
an emergency room doctor told me something that hadn't that I hadn't known about because when I initially started seeing the patient, the emergency room doctor's note was not in the chart. So that's also a tricky thing sometimes if you miss information and that's why it's a good idea to try if at all possible to get some feedback and some interchange with the emergency room doctor and see what their gut feeling is, how they feel about the situation overall. And you also want to be flexible. You don't, your opinion does not need to be written in stone. So again, if you feel after seeing the patient, getting collateral information, that it's okay to discharge the patient, but then the emergency room doctor says, oh, you know, I heard this and this from, let's say, the patient's family, then you want to really feel free to change your mind. So we don't want to be stubborn or rigid because that could really be a problem for the patient then, and you might make a decision that could be dangerous. Thank you.